Welcome. Uh, I've, I have a, I've start with a survey, please. A lot of people here. How many people are graduates of Hillsdale College? How, how many people have uh, had a class with Steve Smith? And so I happen to know that there's probably 300 people who've had a class with Steve Smith in the city, and most of them have stayed away. <laughs> 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 well done, Steve. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so a lot of you, are, most of you are not graduates of Hillsdale College, and uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Larry Arn. I work at the college. Um, this is the Alan P. Kirby Jr. Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship. It's a, uh, oh look, the Waylands are here. Sorry, I keep seeing old friends and I can't help myself. Uh, by the way, the great Linda Chavez is here tonight. She should stand up. Um, she's a tough and wonderful and principled woman and an old friend of mine. I can't help but recognize her. Um, this center is an odd thing. There isn't anything else like it in this city because it's a teaching place with an affinity for the principles of the country. And that's because the college was founded that way in 1844. It was founded to support civil and religious freedom and intelligent piety. Those are sacred causes at our college, and we, we teach them, we serve them in the way that teaching institutions do. We study, and we think, and we learn, and we try to prove things. Uh, we try to dwell in the high and beautiful things. And the college has done very great service for our country. A lot of it's commemorated in this building. It's a fact that some of our students helped carry the casket of Abraham Lincoln to his final resting place, and they had earned the right to do that by winning the Congressional Medal of Honor in battle. We're proud of things like that at our college, and it's a story about our college that our service to our country always grows more intense when it's dangerous. It's when a crisis is upon us that fundamental things come open, and right now is just such a crisis and colleges are good at fundamental things. Most, many of these people in this room, I know from the time they were 18 years old. I had them in class, many of them myself. I know what they're like. I look at them almost like children of my own. I've watched them grow up, and now I marvel that they've become so accomplished. I can hardly believe it. And because we deal with people of that age, we are trapped. We can never get on beyond the first and the most important things. We never really get to do anything very sophisticated. We always just get to do things that are very high. And things that are very high and very fundamental, those are the things all of a sudden that people become very interested in when everything is at stake. Shall we live in the United States of America under a system of constitutional rule which requires limited government and separation of powers and representation, or shall what is soon to happen if it's not stopped happen, and that is the public sector actually grow to be larger than the private sector in its expenses. And if that happens, is that not a fundamental change in the whole meaning and purpose of the country? And such a change could only be justified by a different interpretation of men and things and God and nature. And so if, you, if you're interested in that kind of subject today, you have to study men and things and God and nature. And guess what we do for a living? And so our idea about this building is we built this building so that the activity of studying those things could go on right here in the city where it doesn't go on and where then the city could learn by its proximity to that activity that not everything is a tool. Some things are things for which all tools are to be used. And we think that attitude would be very good for this city. And so we built this pretty building, and we welcome a lot of people like you. We welcome our own students, and then we welcome people in active politics and talk more slowly when they're here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was an easy joke. Many of them are very bright. And s <laughs> if it's an intense time, then it's a time to study statesmanship, because the people who are the greatest statesmen are the people who can lead through a time when everything is up for grabs. What better example of that is there than Sir Thomas More, St. Thomas More? Because what did he do? 
if uh, prudence is the virtue of the statesman and it's a kind of understanding, if it finds the truth and the high things and the details and circumstances that swell around, if it has the capacity to master those details and not let, lose sight of the final ends, then whoever waged a war of wits for his own life and the soul of his country more famously or on such a high level as Thomas More. And because it happened on such a high level, it is a lifelong task to get any real grasp of what was going on there because he was a man of incredible power and sophistication. And none of us mere mortals can really hope ever to approach that kind of understanding unless someone comes along to help us and that someone would have to be a teacher. And it just so happens there is a great teacher of Thomas More here tonight. To be a teacher at Hillsdale College is a challenging calling because those of you who've been there will know the truth of what I'm about to say. If you're not a good teacher, you get hazed out of the place because people won't take your classes. <laughs> And we do the radical thing at the college that we don't really set lower limits on classes. And so if you walk down the hall and you see somebody sitting there and then there's only one other person in the room, it means that Professor Smith is not teaching that class. <laughs> he thrives in an atmosphere. He, uh, so what did, I, I can never remember where he went to college. Did you go to Notre Dame and then UD? Irish. Yeah, and, <laughs> and see the Notre Dame thing, he's a late bloomer, he couldn't get into Hillsdale. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't predict based on that experience that he would be the man I'm about to show you. He, uh, he did study there at the University of Dallas in graduate school with a man named Wegemer, whom I happen to know a little bit and he's a fantastic man and one of the great knowers of Thomas More. Steve Smith is, uh, he's a, you know, to me what he is, is a great colleague who it's always delightful to meet on the sidewalk because you never fail to learn something when you do. He's always got something great to say. He sends you little uh, quotes from the bard, as he puts it, or Dante or More, the three things he probably loves the best and certainly blows off about the most. <laughs> And he, and he carries them around in his mind. And uh, if you ever go and sit in one of his classes, it's a fantastic experience. And he knows those three things. He's got books out about uh, more that so far are, one's a source book, just recently published a book of more letters called For All Seasons. And they are fundamental to the scholarship on more because there are ways to find out the facts about him and there's some interpretation in there that Steve has written on the basis of his deep knowledge. He's got a book coming out soon that I'm waiting for very keenly about Shakespeare's late plays. And uh, it's gonna be fabulous because I know because he sent me little notes about things he's thinking about and it's probably half the book by now. <laughs> and I, get, I, I imagine I'll still be expected to pay for the flipping book. <laughs> and I will. Of Steve, it's clear that in a great faculty He's one of the few best. And that's because his life is a meditation upon that combination of thought and action that makes up human life. And for that reason, he follows in the footsteps of Thomas More and is the best equipped man I know to help us do the same thing. Please welcome Stephen Smith. Well, you notice Dr. Arn did not mention how many of his former students are in attendance. Uh, but we'll, we can take up that during the uh, reception afterwards. Um, thanks, of course, to the Kirby Center uh, and to David Bob and to the Fusco Foundation um, for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Um, and thank you to, to you all um, for sharing this night with me and a little bit of time on, on Sir Thomas More. I must say I'm surprised to see so many uh, friendly faces, um, former students and, and current students here. Uh, it warms my heart and, uh, and, and stirs a lot of good, good memories from, from Hillsdale. Uh, I should also add before I launch into the talk here, uh, I've arrived in DC with my dear wife, Laura, 
and our three sons, who are being watched by my niece right now. <clears throat> if you hear sirens, um, talk to Laura. Um, but in any event, uh, if you really, if you don't think Washington, D.C. is a great city, um, you should really come and visit it with an 8-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 12-year-old. Um, because they think this is uh, the greatest city they've ever been in. And I know that for some of us, uh, it can strike us differently. Um, but it's been very beautiful to see their, their excitement over, over this city and over this place. So, Sir Thomas More. Uh, a man in full and a man for our season, Thomas More has intrigued generations of writers and thinkers, citizens and statesmen alike. And I wanted to just start by invoking um, the words of some of his admirers because, you know, you can know a man by his admirers often. Uh, William Shakespeare wrote of Moore as, quote, marrying wit and wisdom, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, and living justice for truth's sake and his conscience. One thing a lot of people don't know is that Shakespeare collaborated on a play that was never produced called The Book of Sir Thomas More. Uh, and that play contains pages in Shakespeare's own hands, the only surviving writing we have from William Shakespeare, speeches from, by, about Thomas More. Uh, a mysterious text, one that was never produced. Um, it may be because uh, it was, you know, the, the attempted, you know, at least first production of it was during Elizabeth's reign. But in any case, a very positive play about Moore, uh, remarkably so, and a very intriguing piece of writing. Uh, Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travels, numbered Thomas More among the six great defenders of liberty in the Western tradition. And even went so far as to claim Moore was the, quote, person of greatest virtue these islands ever produced. Now, if you've read Gulliver's Travels, you know you have a sort of world-class misanthrope on your hands. Uh, and Jonathan Swift, as Elizabeth Bennett said of Mr. Darcy, you have a propensity to hate everybody. Uh, and so when I read this for the first time, I was stunned. The, the person of the greatest virtue these islands have, as, have ever produced? You gotta be kidding me, Jonathan Swift. And of course, in our own, our, not our own, but the 20th century, I was born in 1972, sorry. Um, <clears throat> not that young. Winston Churchill, Sir Winston Churchill, admired the noble and heroic stand of Moore. And Chesterton wrote that Moore, quote, may come to be counted the greatest Englishman, or at least the greatest historical character in English history. Chesterton also wrote in the 1920s that Moore was, yes, important at that turning point in the West, history of the West, but he would be truly important in about 100 years' time, which would put that round about 2020 or so. What would have moved Chesterton to make such a statement that we would need the example of Thomas More in about 100 years' time, about 2020? Um, perhaps he was a little off, maybe by a decade or so. Um, but in any case, that time is nearly upon us, and so I offer these um, comments partly in uh, response to that question. Right? And this one, too. How did one free and educated man make an impact like this on his own country and across centuries, such that he would be canonized on the eve of World War II, named Lawyer of the Millennium in 1999? That's a tough poll to win. <laughs> Uh, and finally proclaimed patron of statesmen at the beginning of the third millennium. Most importantly, though, uh, what counsels does such a man offer to all of us, to all of you? You're obviously ambitious and good-willed. Many of you are at work in this place or want to work in this place. Fit by nature, perhaps called to be statesmen yourselves, to play a decisive role in the daily drama of your country, your community, your family, sometimes a hidden role, sometimes a very public one. The focus of these brief remarks is on becoming a statesman. The focus is not so much on policy uh, and the stuff of czars, um, not so much about the ever-present business that's blink blinking at us, notifying us through our smartphones, uh, but rather the stuff of the interior, the stuff of character, our stuff within, what Homer called. Now, Homer was the only poet more praised without any qualification whatsoever. 
the pith of the person, the pith of the man. It's forging, it's direction, it's truth, it's consequences, and it's decisive importance. Now, very briefly, uh, as you heard from Dr. Arne, uh, Moore was a Londoner, an Englishman, born in 1478, died in 1535. Among the best educated Englishmen, educated at Oxford, then he followed his father's uh, and his family's tradition, legal, uh, civil service uh, in London. He was a member of parliament from as early as 1504. So he worked for 30 years um, in governing. Under Sheriff of London, diplomat, he entered the king's service in 1518. By the way, he wasn't crazy about entering the king's service. This is a dispute among the scholars. One reason being that he'd give up his status as a citizen of London and become the king's man. He thought becoming the king's man was a risky proposition. Um, and we might think ahead to 1535 and probably chuckle with him because he had a great sense of humor. Right? Entering the king's service, speaker of the house, chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Lord Chancellor of England, dead on a scaffold in 1535. Now, I remember about 14 years ago, I had the privilege of standing in the Tower of London, in his cell, which is very hard to uh, get into. Uh, and I stood there. It was a very silent, quiet place, not particularly accommodating, not exactly the Hampton Inn. Um, and I really thought for the first time in my life, really struck by the question, how was it possible to play a part like this man played? to sit in this cell at the, end, at the end of a tremendous life of drama for 14 months and then to be unjustly condemned and have your head forcibly removed from your body, which, by the way, was mercy from Henry. A lot of people don't know that. If you were friends with the king, beheading. If not, I suppose, drawing and quartering. Um, you might say with friends like that. Uh, <laughs> it was a mercy. Right? Um, but how is it possible to play a part like more play? Uh, was my sort of basic, fundamental wonder, right? Now, one thing we'll, we'll do tonight, one thing I want to call attention to, is, is the need not to skip over Moore's life and jump into the Tower of London cell. Because that is not how he lived, not what he did. Occasionally, you'll hear folks say, um, you know, persecutions are great. We should welcome them. Yeehaw! Um, this was not Moore's approach. In fact, he exercised every means possible to avoid this, uh, to the tune of writing one million words, working constantly. He remarked in the Tower of London, I think the work hurt my heart and cost me my health. This is in the months before his death, but I would do it again. I was trying to get some, some sense of a million words, just, just for fun, you know? The kind of thing you do when you're just writing a speech all by yourself. Um, that's 35,000 tweets. <laughs> or perhaps something more substantial, 1,400 op-eds. Tireless. Right? So I was thinking, you know, how is it possible you know, to play a part like that? And then let's not skip over the middle so quickly. Moore was a statesman for many years before this, no less than 30 um, before uh, those fateful days at the end of his life. For the talk tonight, I've gleaned 10 counsels from my study of Moore from the last decade or so. These counsels are offered to you free of charge for all seasons, for the seasons before the prison cell, and if it comes to it, for the prison cell as well. You will discover, I hope, that Moore's world is a good deal like our own, a world of family, community, learning, politics, power, tragedy, but a world in which he was immersed with care and love, a world that differs little from our own. Now, the man himself, the knight, that's another matter. A man in full, a man for our season. Thomas More challenges us and counsels us and prepares us 
uh, for the seasons to come. I think it's important when you study to let the book or let the person challenge you. You have so many habits of reading at arm's length uh, or of not letting works of art, uh, councils, biography, history challenge us. Uh, but of course, this is how Moore lived and I want to invite you to, to be challenged. Right? Now, of course, we're all works in progress, um, but in any event, now to the councils. Council one, I'm trying to think of some way to capture this. Improve thy wit, exclamation point. He wouldn't use an exclamation point. It's high time we pause and take our own education and personal formation much, much more seriously. For Moore, the most educated Englishman of his time, the only true genius in England, liberal education had as its purpose the freedom of the person. It was a path to greatness of soul. In the words of Seneca, you see why liberal studies are so called, because they are studies worthy of the free. But there is only one really liberal study, that which gives a person his liberty. That is the study of wisdom, that is lofty, that is brave, that is great souled. The chancellor of both Oxford and Cambridge, Moore was convinced that he stood personally in great need, regardless of his future profession, vocation, of just such an education. In particular, he needed the philosopher's understanding of human nature, the historian's knowledge and understanding of his own country, the the theologian's teaching on eternity and the soul, the poet's art of seeing and making and moving human hearts. While there's much to say about Moore's understanding of each of these things, I want to focus on one in particular. In one of his later works, Moore is having a conversation, it's a dialogue, with a young man fresh from Cambridge, a sharp fellow but half-educated and doubtful of the importance of liberal education in particular. As Moore discusses the vital importance of liberal education, he observes, your reason, dear sir, is by study, labor, and exercise of the liberal arts, strengthened and quickened, and your judgment both in them and in orators, laws, and stories much ripened. And although poets are taken by many men just for painted words or sophists, yet they do much help the judgment and make a man among other things well furnished in one special thing without which all learning is in vain or half lame. What's that? The young man asks. A good mother wit. I love that expression. Well, good mother wit gained in particular from the study of the great poets. As one fruit of his own incomparable education, Moore believed that poetry, especially the great poets, ripened this mother wit, this guardian wit, this well-seasoned and exercised practical judgment, a wit that helps the person day in and day out, making him capable of good and discerning service. The study of great poets in particular delights the reader by its beauty and moreover confers a sense of the realities of the human drama an accurate perception of the nature of things, and especially exercises the wit, the imagination, the intellect, the desire. As Moore writes elsewhere, great poetry works to instill the good through sweetness and beauty, to foster the love of truth and wisdom. Now perhaps in the reception afterwards or in the Q&A, discuss his most famous book, Utopia, which is just such a book and just such an educational experience. Later, Moore himself will be described as marrying wit and wisdom. If we consider wit as poetry and wisdom as philosophy, we can see that for Thomas More, wit needs wisdom and wisdom needs wit. There needs to be a new marriage of poetry and philosophy after the great divorce of recent centuries. The philosophers should not banish the poets, nor should the poets mock the philosophers. The two should, like the blind man and the lame man, Moore wrote about in one of his poems, form a firm league of friendship and concord for the sake of their common good. Perhaps in the midst of such pressing concerns, it can seem the height of foolishness to say we must become wittier, okay? to foster mother wit. We must study Homer and Dante and Shakespeare. But there it is. 
We may have wisdom, but we seem to lack a little wit. Robert Bolt, the great 20th century playwright, wrote in Man for All Seasons, God made the angel, this is Thomas More speaking, God made the angels to show his splendor. He made animals for innocence, plants for simplicity. But men and women he made to serve him wittily in the tangle of their minds. I should add an important point from Thomas More's biography. He not only studied these things during his formal education, this is perhaps the most impressive thing about him, but for 17 years after he left Oxford University. 17 years, Cicero, Latin classics, Greek classics, rising at four in the morning, mastering Greek in three years, such that he could have a translation contest with Erasmus into Latin, right? He was at once immersed in the detailed business of London and governance, and yet he forged that zone of silence, that habit of reflection, that habit of study, such that a later writer would describe his study as, quote, the watch and ward of England. The defense of England was his study. Now again, this is a man who's immersed in practical affairs to an unprecedented extent. And yet, and yet, and yet, the habit of reflection, the zone of silence. His keen study during all these years, devoted to smaller duties, ordinary offices and work, furnished him with the principles that guided him and gave his political and personal life coherence, unity, and effectiveness. Council one. Now, council two um, is based on Cicero. Examine your favorite image. <laughs> Examine your own images, especially of a greatly lived and greatly led human life. Moore was known as the English Christian Cicero, which is a very interesting title to think about. English, local, his native place. Cicero, classical. Christian, biblical, all three together in a unity. In Cicero's great work on the orator, he says, the liberal arts were devised for the purpose of fashioning the young according to humanity and virtue. In his last work on duties, Cicero counsels his son, this is the important point, work out your own ideas, sift your thoughts, look within, to see what conception of a good person, the great soul, you have within you. What image do you have in you of a greatly led and greatly lived human life? It will be of decisive importance. Aristotle said, after all, man is the most imitative of all creatures. So that image that we favor, whatever it is, what is it? Have we examined ourselves on that point? Decisively important. He adds a serious caution to this. If you don't do this, you may end up another Caesar who overturned all laws, human and divine, to achieve for himself a principate fashioned according to his own erroneous opinion and image. On the one hand, a greatly lived and greatly led life, a free life. On the other hand, a tyrannical life, self-destructive, violent, um, and ending badly. The Prince of Denmark then, couldn't, couldn't get too far without a reference to Shakespeare, was right to ask, what is a man? Right? What is a greatly lived human life? Whatever answer we make to this question really will be the idea, the image according to which we fashion ourselves. Let's examine ourselves on this point. What do we admire as a moving image of greatness? What do we have in the treasure house of our memory? Are the images good? Are they ambiguous? Are they awful? Have we ever examined them or tested them? What's the best image of human greatness available to us? For more, it was the union, as Shakespeare wrote in Macbeth, of highness and holiness. Council three, pursue integrity, but don't be surprised by frailty. Moore was the first English writer to use the word integrity. He understood integrity to be consistency in thought, word, and action, 
a demanding but liberating form of life, requiring sure conscience and sure deliberation to achieve its end. Consistency in thought, in word, in deed. Oneness of soul. To be blunt, Moore's last years, the time in the tower, really the fruit of a lifelong, habitual, daily struggle to be one man instead of two, or three, or whatever the case may be. Here is an urgent point. Do I struggle to live this oneness? Am I a truthful person? Are my heart and my face one? Are my thought and my words one? Am I consistent? Is my life a unity or a duplicity? Am I one person or perhaps some strange equation of imaginary numbers that don't quite add up? The fact that Moore was canonized should not hide from our eyes that his case was precisely as ours is, and hence the real value of his struggles and examples. He found it difficult to be one man instead of two. He found it a daily struggle to live this kind of, of unity. Now you know, um, if you cast your mind into, uh, to Macbeth, Shakespeare's great play, the anthem of the witches around the cauldron, right? double, double, toil and trouble. Right? You know, for Shakespeare, this is a, as important a point as it is for more. Double, trouble. <laughs> Single, rare, beautiful, powerful, consistent, free. So pursue integrity. Don't be surprised by frailty. The difference between Thomas More, who was able to live in this way, and others in his time, was habitual attention to his conscience and following its trustworthy counsel and lead. He did not make peace with his sins or his errors. When he became aware of them, he confessed them and began again this quest to be one man. Because of his understanding of the human being, he was not surprised by his own frailty. He just knew what to do about it. It's interesting if you look at his writings on education. His daughters were the best educated women in Europe. If you've seen Man for All Seasons, you may remember the scene where Henry speaks to Margaret, Meg, in Latin, and Margaret responds, and Henry is at a complete loss. Perhaps because his own Latin's not so good. <laughs> like, Whoa, hey, how did you happen? Right? Um, well, Moore took great care over his children's education. He knew education was um, profound um, experience uh, and part of what makes a culture great and sustains it. I suppose that's why we should pay special attention, uh, not just to current debates on, say, health care, um, but what of education? Right? But when he spoke to his children's um, teacher, he said, teach them Latin, teach them the classics, teach them the church fathers, teach them scripture, teach them this. Teach. He gave this long list, as you might imagine. But he said, never forget to teach them to pay habitual attention to their conscience, to form the conscience, to give it light so that it can help them. He wrote to his daughter's teacher, the whole fruit of their education should consist in the testimony of God and a good, peaceful conscience. Thus they will be inwardly at peace, neither stirred by excessive praise and flattery, nor prey to ridicule and mockery. Pay attention, Thomas More urges us, to the conscience daily, and especially take the pains to educate it, form it, uh, and help it do its work. Of course, on this point, this Council on Integrity, um, everyone in Moore's story experienced a tremendous reversal of fortune, a turn. And in Moore and in Shakespeare, the question that's often asked is, well, when it turns on you, these, to these political men, when you who are ruling now uh, are brought low. What will you have left after your power is taken from you, your office is taken from you, 
your influence is taken. And Shakespeare gives a beautiful answer to this in one of his late plays. All that I have left is my robe and my integrity to heaven. And the soul dies. Right? Happily, actually. Counsel four, live order for the love of life, yourself, your family, and your friends. Again, just to have a hammer on this point. By all accounts, Thomas More was extraordinarily busy. And he didn't even have an iPhone. Right? <clears throat> or even the crudest of notification centers. My new favorite thing. Father, friend, lawyer, judge, member of parliament, author, thinker, wretched singer even in his local choir. <laughs> Moore's is a story of the struggle to do all things well, to be just to each of his commitments, to serve his priorities with love, and to live his earthly vocation with care. That word vocation is particularly important for Thomas More. Calling. It's the subject of one of his first books, The Life of Pico. And Pico, for all of his intellectual greatness, becomes a tragic figure because he either did not ask, what am I called to do? Or when he found out what he was called to do, he did not correspond to the call. So for Mortis, this concept of vocation was tremendously important. He also laughed a bit about being so busy. Has anyone read Utopia? By the way, we have to have a memo to uh, radio commentary, uh, a commentator who thinks the Utopia is, is something other than a satire. I've learned about this in recent days. Um, Thomas More was not a socialist. Right? Despite the monument in Red Square, Moscow, that is uh, dedicated to him. Um, we can talk again about that later. But in, in the preface to Utopia, he talks about what his life was really like. He's like, I'm just trying to publish this thing. Just trying to finish this book. He's writing to his friend, Peter Giles. My other tasks, Peter, they leave me no leisure at all. I am constantly engaged in legal business. I plead, I hear, I give an award as an arbiter. I decide a case as a judge. I pay a visit of courtesy to one man. I go on business to another. I devote almost my entire day in public to other men's affairs and only the remainder to my own. I leave to myself that is to learning and writing almost nothing at all. When I have returned home, I must talk with my wife, chat with the children, confer with my servants. All of this activity I count my proper business when it must be done. And it must be done unless you want to be a stranger in your own home. Amid these occupations, the day, the month, the year slips away. When can I ever find time to write? I have yet spoken a word about sleep or eating, <laughs> which for many people takes up as much time as sleep. And sleep takes up almost half a man's life. So I get for myself only the time I filch from sleeping and eating. Now, of course, you want to add to this. He did publish Utopia. He was able to uh, finish things. And yet, immersed in this way throughout his entire um, working life, adult life. I suppose the takeaway value from that quotation, though, which always has struck me, unless you want to be a stranger in your own house. Moore was very much aware of that possibility, um, of that temptation. And he would prove just to each of his commitments. If I'm urging one thing in this council or even tonight, it's that this kind of attentive, real, well-led life is both desirable and possible. It's not just a fiction uh, or a nice dream. Right? Of course, it's arduous, it's difficult, but we know that which costs little is valued little. The last council. Council five. Um, we're a brass tax council. I'll never forget, it was once asked by a friend, dude, have you thought about brass tax? Right? He was rebuking my, my wayward, idealistic temperament that was uh, flying around and not attending to things. Council five, know your profession. Has it ever struck you 
I need more knowledge and capability than I have at present. One of my favorite things in all of England is the Great Vine at Hampton Court Palace. Has anyone seen this? It was the masterwork of Capability Brown, this famous gardener. Look what a title, Capability Brown. Um, but do I need more knowledge and capability? Is goodwill, good desires, even good opinions enough? Again, Moore's example is instructive. Nothing can replace the careful study of particulars and real experience, what you might call the doctoral program um, of painful but instructive living. There may be the appearance of knowledge without such things, but not a wisdom that can govern. Nothing can ever replace, Moore's example suggests, knowing what you are defending, affirming it as clearly and deeply and precisely as possible. Again, if we focus too much on the death of Moore, which is truly splendid, a great glimmering in the gloom even, we might pass over too quickly this nitty gritty of his professional life, his utter competency and professional excellence. Under sheriff, master of the laws of England, lawyer, judge, the Everton figure 900 cases he could dispatch. I mean, it's incredible to consider. You have to, you have to know something to be able to judge like that so quickly and so fairly. He even worked, one of his first jobs, on the sewer system of London. And this, is, this to me is one of these examples that actually tells you something about Thomas More. That, yep, yeah, got to fix it. <laughs> Ooh, it's causing a lot of trouble, right? Immersed uh, even in that, right? He was a fully formed citizen who knew exactly what made his native London great and whose understanding of justice and prudence was formed through the daily struggles of a free and virtuous and self-governing place. It also, of course, helped that he had studied the history of his own country the way Tacitus studied Rome. Council six, and that, this is the council that, uh, I gave a talk to house staffers yesterday and it seemed to strike a chord. Um, I know it, it does for me as well, that's why I included it. Be a friend, never a flatterer. Right. It's actually an interesting anecdote. Erasmus, Thomas More's great friend, wrote, he was born for friendship. If you want a perfect example of the art of friendship, study this man. Of course, we're all born for friendship. And one of the interesting things, um, historically, is that More and Erasmus both realized that People in positions of power or authority find this to be a very elusive experience. Not uncommon to hear someone say, oh, so-and-so, he has no friends, though he's surrounded by people all day long. Meetings, dinners, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, round the clock. But then the person who's, say, uh, closest to him, doesn't seem to have friends. Um, on this point, it's interesting, Moore and Erasmus gave a piece of writing from Plutarch to Henry VIII when he was young. It's called How to Tell a Flatterer from a Friend. It's a short piece of writing and even a life-changing piece of writing. Plutarch was one of Shakespeare's great teachers. He was the man who in the life of Alexander the Great says, you know, Sometimes the smallest details of a man's life, the way he makes a joke, the way he introduces some, th these little things tell us more about the truth of a man than the greatest battles or the bloodiest sieges. So Plutarch was you know, one of Shakespeare's master teachers. And in this essay, How to Tell a Flatterer from a Friend, he tries to help um, alert the reader and teach the reader about the all too common experience of being flattered and the all too rare experience of true friendship. So Erasmus and Moore thought it'd be a great idea to give this piece of writing to Henry, who was a young man with fabulous wealth, unlimited personal power, uh, and you know, a, a group of, of men surrounding him who were not exactly looking out for his best interest. And so be a friend never a flatter. How do we understand friendship? Aristotle said it's like two bodies sharing one soul. 
Scripture says, if you found a friend, you found a treasure. And yet one contemporary writer has said, referring to America, we suffer from friendship deficit disorder, especially men. It's a rare experience, too rare. It's like living a riddle. Again, being surrounded by people, being in communication with people constantly, and yet without friendship. Friends will the good for one another, we're told by the tradition. Friends dare to help and correct one another, we're told by the tradition. Perhaps the most graphic examples of Moore's friendship, friendship to his daughter by not coming out of the cell, though she begged him. Or even his death. What are Thomas More's last words? I die the king's good servant and God's first. Who is he quoting on the scaffold? Well, he, he said it. This was Henry VIII's counsel to More when More entered his service. More was concerned that serving the king might hurt him. He said, Thomas, I want you to be, to be one of my men, right? And you will never, you know, you will always be able to live God first and then the king. So Moore's death, those words that were quoted, I've always understood as something like a last act of friendship directed by Moore to Henry VIII, reminding him. Finally, one of Moore's last letters that he wrote, you can read about this in, in the new book of letters, it was written to a man named Anthony Bonvisi. And Bonvisi was an Italian, lifelong friend of Thomas More. He visited More in the tower. He risked royal wrath in doing so. Brought him a warm gown, brought him some wine, brought him a little conversation. Nothing spectacular. And More wrote just in a few months before his death, Thank you, Anthony. This was the experience that has helped me in this place, in this tower. He says, through you, through friendship, I've experienced something like a certain taste of the loving kindness of God. And, you know, he meant that. He loved friendship, born for friendship. And especially now, right? How, how are our friendships? Uh, and, and can we do everything we can to improve the culture of, of friendship? Right? And never to be flatterers. Council 7, another sort of brass tacks, but important council. Be a citizen of citizens. Or to use Moore's own language, be a first citizen. Be a leading citizen. In his early writings in particular, Moore advocated the education and the formation of, quote, first or leading citizens. So this is what a country needs most, this type of soul, right? first citizen or leading citizen. My mentor, Jerry Wegemer, has um, explained this beautifully in his new book, The Young Thomas More. The Renaissance, the rebirth of education and good letters, was accompanied by a deep understanding of the need for well and wisely trained citizens, Thomas More's words, which you'll hardly find anywhere, he says, if a people is ever to be free, self-governing, and virtuous. Like Shakespeare, More shared the concern about the formation of such citizens and the pain and the tragedy when they are absent. It would be a tragedy, both writers suggest, for Christians to be equipped with the best principles and yet incompetent in the exercise of rule over themselves and others. We should not slight human things, human virtues, and human art. Shakespearean tragedy in particular is as painful as any uh, on this subject. And Shakespeare seems to point out both the, 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 the truth, the, the goodness of, of certain characters, and yet their incompetence in the play. And the incompetence is, is actually deadly in Shakespearean drama. For some reason, they don't know how to be as active uh, and effective as possible. They never learn that art, though they have the best principles in the play. Council 8, 
aligned it more like quite a bit. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. This point is on the importance of the cardinal virtue of prudence. In that play, Book of Sir Thomas More, More plays the part of prudence in this play within the play. And of course, was the part he played in English history. I might also add, be wise as serpents and innocent as, as doves. Do everything you can do to avoid another civil war. Do everything you can to foster friendship and concord here. This point on prudence is one of the most important counsels of more. Do we understand this word? Do we consciously seek to become more and more truly prudent and not simply cunning or astute or clever? What is it? The habitual power and ability to see and make judgments and decisions in the light of what actually exists without the distortions that arise from our desires, expectations, or bad imaginations. The proper act of this virtue, according to Thomas Aquinas, is command. If you are to command, if you are to lead yourself and others, you need this virtue in particular. As mentioned earlier, Moore did not rush into the Tower of London. He served practically with that wit and that wisdom exercising every means in service of the end until it became no longer possible to do so. All means were exercised to preserve his liberty and to keep the country from descending into chaos and civil war. So wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Prudence. Now the last two councils are, I suppose, the tower councils, but they're very important. Council nine, famous line from Utopia, Never abandon the ship in a storm because you cannot control the wind. This counsel, of course, is on the virtue of fortitude. For many, the virtue most obviously associated with Thomas More is fortitude. What is it? What do we mean when we use this word? We mean courage, we mean guts, do we mean toughness? Like, what do we mean? The habitual power of enduring hardship, even death, even wounds, in the service of a high and arduous good. Again, most graphically, it is the willingness to suffer wounds, to be hurt, the willingness even to endure death. One specific act of friendship that more encourages us on, I think, is don't abandon the ship in the storm. Learn what fortitude is and practice fortitude. He needed it. He feared in the tower. He feared for his family. He feared for his daughters. He knew the taste of fear, as Macbeth said. And yet he had that fortitude um, to, to suffer and to die. Another point from Shakespeare that's fascinating to me, the more you study these tragedies, what happens is that some tyranny is unfolding in a play, or some tragic um, plot moment. And Shakespeare will often show us characters all standing almost in a ring around the action, not stepping forward, not intervening, not speaking, not opening their mouth. That's why when King Lear comes in with his daughter's body in his arms, which is, which is one of the most famous and bleak moments in Shakespearean tragedy, he says, murderers, traitors, cowards all. Right? Exclamation point. He's furious. And of course, he's crazy too, but he's furious. A very Shakespearean moment. Right? Were there moments when this could have been stopped? Were there, were there little moments when tyranny could have been checked through a small act of fortitude? We often think of the large acts of fortitude or bravery. But Moore's life was a sort of forging uh, on this point. Right? Little acts of fortitude, little acts of courage creating that habit. It's amazing, and sometimes my students don't believe me, uh, that only a handful of souls actually opposed Henry. It's mind-boggling to think of an entire country silent. Okay. Or uh, playing along with it. Maybe they thought things would change. Who knows? Okay. Uh, but never abandon the ship in a storm. The other great lesson from Shakespearean tragedy is 
his version of this, don't leave the play early. He loves to show this. The characters, the drama intensifying, becoming more urgent, becoming more, well, maybe involving wounds or pain or suffering. And the characters will say things like, I got to get out of here. Or, I need to leave now. <laughs> exit, exit, exit. I need to get off the present stage. I don't like it here. <laughs> this is going to hurt. <laughs> and I've thought, you know, teaching Shakespeare for 10 years with my students, the commandment, one of them of Shakespearean drama, is most certainly thou shalt not leave early. Exclamation. Quite seriously. Never abandon the ship in the storm. Now, when he gets to the Tower of London, he invokes the same image of a ship's captain again and says it would be the immortal infamy of a captain to abandon his ship under such circumstances. We don't want to overlook again how he became a man capable of fortitude at the highest level. Again, with points of becoming a statesman, this talk is to direct our attention to this middle story, this instructive biography and tale, um, what Shakespeare would call the chronicle of day by day, moment by moment, decision by decision, act of fortitude by act of fortitude. Chances are you will not be in the Tower of London tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. The headsman will not be. <laughs> it's not good. It would be a different kind of day. Right. I hope. Right. So how did he become prepared for that? Right. And of course, you know, for this council, as with all the councils, um, I know, my, speaking for myself, I, I like to allow these figures to, to challenge me. Am I willing to suffer wounds? Endure even death? Or do I prefer that, say, the truth suffers because of me? At the end, of course, um, Moore loved his family, his country, so much so that he was willing to lose it for their sake. Council 10, the last council. Be of good cheer, you can overcome the world. Finally, the last council. In a way, it's related to the first, wit. Moore was among the funniest of souls, which may not have come out entirely in, in some of the councils. Only Thomas More, you might say, could jest to the executioner who would behead him, do your work, dear sir, but spare my beard. For it, at least, has not been found guilty of treason. Right? Taking care of his beard, even. Right? What a jest. I mean, he was literally just moments from death. A jest. Remembered. Folks who saw this, eyewitnesses, well, he was either a wise, foolish man or a foolish, wise man. He was either insane or <laughs> peaceful. Joyful? This Mary Wit, of course, has deep roots. I want to end with this counsel. Certainly Thomas More had an eye for the ridiculous in human life. He delighted in all kinds of satires on our common human frailties. He accepted jests broken on his own head. He had perspective on himself and on the political stage, while not abandoning the ship or standing on the sidelines. This habit made him fit for both life and death and prepared him and enabled him to play the part he was called to play. The true foundation of his humor was his gladness and joy inwardly, his faith and his trust in God. You might say Thomas More's immortal sense of humor was refined in this key daily habit, personal reflection and prayer, confidence in God's strength as the key to his own fortitude. This habit not only strengthened his performance of daily duties, the key to which was his great love, but it also conferred a peace of soul that made him capable of the ultimate sacrifice. And of saying at his trial to the men he had known his entire life and who are now condemning him to death, may we all make merry together in heaven. Among the statesmen, of course, Moore was no, never alone in this personal, practical, operative faith. 
Of course, George Washington um, is an interesting and famous American example. Sir Winston Churchill at the Siege of Gibraltar asked for the precise words of a particular prayer. Fear not the result, for either thy end will be enviable and majestic, or God shall preserve us upon the waters. What's instructive when you look at souls like this is that they were statesmen. They were leaders. They were learned. They were also souls of prayer. It was not something that was foreign to them. In conclusion, I hope these counsels, given from my study of the man, my friendship with him, really, provide some pause or some fresh fire, or at least some sense of how a single free and educated man became a statesman, the true friend of his country, such that the following would be written about him centuries later. He was a strong and courageous spirit who knew how to despise resolutely the flattery of human respect and how to resist in accordance with his duty the supreme head of his state. Nor could the tears of his wife or the tears of his children make him swerve or turn aside from the path of virtue. Then, of course, there's the man for all seasons. When Meg is asking him, begging him to come out of that tower cell, look now, Meg, if we lived in a state where virtue was profitable, common sense would make us good and greed would make us saintly. We'd live like animals or angels in the happy land that never needs heroes. But since, in fact, we see that avarice, anger, envy, pride, sloth, lust, and stupidity commonly profit beyond humility, chastity, fortitude, justice, and thought, we have to choose to be human at all. Why then, perhaps, Meg, we must stand fast a little, even at the risk of being heroes. The last counsel of Thomas More. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. We have time now for a few questions. Please wait until the mic comes to you and raise your hand if you would like to ask one. Sure. Go ahead. You have to wait for the kitty over here. The gentleman in the blazer. Uh, did you have any uh, major objections to the movie, A Man for All Seasons? You found uh, incorrect or... <laughs> sure, good question. It's a, it's a brilliant movie. Um, and I think quite truthful to more. Uh, in fact, uh, the more you think about stories and how difficult it really is to write a story well, the more you admire Robert Bolt's <laughs> gift for this. Uh, it's really quite hard to do, uh, write a play like he wrote. The only objection that comes up for me personally in the, in the um, play. It's just a point of emphasis. The speech when Thomas More says, it's what I believe. It's about myself. You know, he, he speaks in this way about the self. Um, and you know, to me, at that moment, it's the only moment really in the play where I think, well, that, that sounds a, lot, I mean, a little bit more like Robert Bolt speaking. Um, but other than that, a very powerful image of um, Thomas More's life. And, and tremendously effective. Um, I certainly could have, have shared lines from that, even line after line from that, from that great film and play. Um, but I think uh, a moving and, and beautiful um, film and play. But again, it's the point that the speech where Moore speaks about his motives. And he says, because I believe my own self. And it just, it, it sort of rings um, false, like a false note to my ears. Uh, I think he's making a serious point that it's personal. Okay. I'm responsible for my soul. Um, but he puts it in the language of self, and uh, again, I just kind of hear a false note there uh, when, I, when I hear that part of the movie. But good movie. Sure. Sure. 
Thank you for your words. Um, I, I too am a teacher and uh, honestly inspired. Um, many see in, in Moore's final resistance uh, and ultimately martyrdom sort of an image of, um, shall we say, like the, 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 the destiny of, of, of a clash between the world and the church and and despair when they see the ends of each in in uh, such well I see such a disparity between the two, and um, and and worry that you know the fate of of the virtuous and and those who love the who love Christ's church will be as sort of a backwater or a vanguard against something that is you know perpetually uh, doesn't share the same ends. Um, I'm trying to think of how to make this a good question without talking any longer. Um, did Moore really see that, that, that the, the ends of each city, if you will, uh, were inimical to one another? Or, I mean, did he have a lot of hope about, hope for that, uh, you know, harmony between the two? Yeah, he, he thought that each, um, the church and, and state each had their, their proper office and proper uh, ends that they served. Um, in fact, you know, the objection, or one of the objections at the end is the head of the temporal order making himself the head of the spiritual order. Um, Moore, you know, m most certainly affirmed the, good, the goodness of the temporal order uh, and, and the goodness of, of the spiritual order. In fact, one of the reasons I, I kept coming back to the point about uh, his career is that Moore's public career is an extraordinary testimony to, to the goodness of, of a normal professional life. Um, he, was, uh, he was a worker in London. Uh, he was a family man. In a way, he, he lived that, that normal life. Um, and he served as a lawyer, a judge. Um, and, and those were all uh, duties that he understood um, as, as good and, and fit and proper for the temporal order to execute. So the, in his case, um, you know, I think you get an affirmation of both spiritual authority and temporal authority, spiritual good and temporal good. And I think it is an error to set them um, at odds with one another. You know, that political life is um, willy-nilly opposed to spiritual principles or spiritual life. I think his life suggests otherwise, even though he died. Of course, the other thing is that from the beginning of his life, uh, friendship with Henry until the end, he knew that Henry had tyrannical leanings. And he was concerned about that uh, from the beginning of, of their relationship. I mean, Henry was a splendid man in a lot of ways. I mean, he, he, was, he was kind of like, he's described as like a god coming down to earth, you know, immense, virile, uh, powerful, virtuous. Erasmus wrote, I mean, this, this guy could be the, you know, he could usher in a new golden age for Christendom. I mean, it's kind of this kind of language. And yet there were concerns um, about his character. And, and Moore knew him very, very well. So what do you do when um, the head of the temporal order is tyrannical? I wouldn't throw the temporal order out. Uh, I would hope for a change of <laughs> at the top. <laughs> but in any case, it's a good question. Very important question. Sure, Davy. Oh, sure. We got. Oh, hold on, Joel. You give it to Mr. Meese. Kind of a follow up on the first question. When you criticized the movie, as uh, in the part where they had more talking in the eye, the second counsel you gave might have provided the rationale for the playwright to do that, mm -hmm. because as you said, Cicero dictated that to find truth, you look within. Mm -hmm. In other words, that could. Yes. Example. Yes, certainly. And I, I think, um, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's a defensible speech viewed with that knowledge. But to my ears, it sounds a little bit like, um, you know, the kind of 20th century language of, of self. That was my only, the only point. Uh, yeah, Cicero said, he's very graphic about this in the Republic, he said that the statesman or the leader's first duty is to examine himself and to provide as in a mirror 
an example to other citizens of this art. The first duty, the first duty of a leader is to examine himself and to provide an example of this for, for the people. So certainly you can, you can uh, make good sense of, of Bolt, but I, I still think the, the language of self leaves me a little cool. Um, the questions? Sure, sir. Right here in front. Uh, I have to confess that the last time I asked a question of a professor was a, to contrast infinitesimal with infinite or finite, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Instead, I'd, I'd like to ask you to, to share so your thoughts in a little more detail on uh, Moore's use of satire in, the, in his writing of an utopia. Thank okay. you. Sure. Uh, Moore admired in particular, he, he, he was a comical, satirical genius. Uh, that, that was his sort of gift as a writer. And so he admired, for example, Lucian, the ancient author, who was one of the great satirists of the, of the ancient world. And he in particular liked Lucian because he said Lucian knew how to reveal our common frailties, to, to hit them, to score hits on them, uh, to poke at them in a healthful way. And in such a way that folks didn't resent being poked at. So that was Lucian's gift. So he was a satirist, yes, but a kind of a healthful one, <laughs> I have to put it. Um, but it, this was his main, end. He, he loved this kind of art. In fact, in the Friendship and Flattery essay that I mentioned, one of the parts that Moore found most valuable was Plutarch's counsel on candor. He said, you know, friends need actually art to help one another. And candor is a kind of artful speech. So he always uh, admired um, satire, uh, especially a wit that can reveal the truth and move the soul, but in such a way that the soul doesn't resent it. And I think, or, or think it uh, an injury entirely. <laughs> um, if you think of our contemporary satirists, I'm not sure this is entirely their gift. Uh, satire's tendency or weakness is to be just simply destructive. Uh, or, or to descend into mockery, pure and simple. Uh, whereas, again, for Moore, it was a revealing of the ridiculous, a revealing of the common frailties of life, um, but, but in a healthful way and in such a way that, um, again, folks never resent the author for his injuries. Now, Moore's most famous satire, of course, is Utopia, uh, which at the beginning of that work, he says, you know, some men don't like satire. They're as allergic to it as a hydrophobic dog is to water. <laughs> okay, it's kind of wit he had. Um, but in that work, you know, in this kind of sunny, high-spirited work before he entered Henry's service, um, Moore is, is gently satirizing intellectuals uh, and humanists. The first audience of the utopia is Moore's fellow intellectuals. Uh, and, and one contemporary has suggested that his, his portrait of Raphael Hithloday, the man who advocates for the utopian order, uh, that, that Raphael is, is an intellectual who proves to be something like the first ideological tyrant in the West, <laughs> thinking, I know better than the traditions of law in my native I, I can arrange the social order better. I can make this more just if you just take away everyone's liberty. <laughs> It'll work great. <laughs> He's very excited. He's got this great idea. You know, and, and Moore is, is satirizing this kind of tyrannical intelligence. And what makes it winning, I think, is he, he had sympathy for it. He understood, you know, hey, you know, folks who want to improve things, uh, or who want greater justice in the temporal order. We'll think, well, what about this? What about that? Why, why is that law in place? Why don't we just throw all the laws out and start all over again? And that work takes as, as a, a target for its satire this kind of mind, uh, and it does so with, with immortal results. I mentioned the uh, contemporary radio personality. Um, you know, Thomas More's Utopia is not 
a work that advocates socialism. Um, this is a, a misunderstanding of the book, uh, one that you can, you can disprove pretty handily. So after Raphael finishes speaking, describing how great utopia is, Thomas More writes, after I heard Raphael out, I thought to myself, quite absurd. <laughs> now, I don't know, again, how people missed that, that sentence. He said, how, that was ridiculous. It was interesting, but ridiculous, right? Um, and yet he said, you know, I could tell that Raphael was tired out from all his talking. And, uh, ironic moment, uh, tired out from all his talking, uh, and that he couldn't really bear contradiction. So Moore said, I decided to take him to dinner instead and then have a follow-up conversation a little bit later on. Okay. Uh, so the work has this spirit, which is satirical um, and winning and gentle. But you can also see in that last detail, that point on friendship. Moore wasn't going to leave this guy, Raphael, the utopian, alone. He wasn't going to abandon him. In fact, he was going to have a meal with him and actually try to ask him some follow-up questions. The problem with Raphael is when you ask him follow-up questions, he answers in a 400-word sentence. And then you ask another question, he gives you a 900-word sentence. And then you ask a third question, he gives you a 40-page monologue. And Moore's like, I'm going to try. Right? He's just tired. Right? <laughs> so he, this, he was a satirical genius. Now, that temperament has its liabilities, too. Some people think, you know, if you meet a satirical person, oh, they don't take anything seriously. It's all a jest. It's all a joke. His detractors at the time called him Master Mock. They said you could never tell if he's being serious or not. Right? <laughs> that, type of, that type of person. Um, but one of, the, one of the other instructive lessons from his life, I suppose, is that you know, he, he knew full well that that gift of humor, that gift of satire, could get him into hot water. Um, and he, and he, you know, he worked to moderate it. In a letter to one of his kids, he said, you know, I really like the letter you wrote me because you make fun of me very artfully. <laughs> and yet, with fitting moderation. <laughs> this is to his son. <laughs> and so you know, that, that was how he looked at it. You know, he, he, you know, he knew himself. Um, and I think because of that, uh, could, could lead himself and, and eventually others. So are we all, uh, any other questions? Or wanna... This will be our last question for the evening. Sure. We Over can... here. Davey, sure. Uh, Dr. Smith, I was just hoping you would share with us <clears throat> uh, what made you love Thomas More in the first place. I was quite serious, thank you. I, I was quite serious about standing in the cell. But to me, that was actually the, the most uh, moving moment because it really it became real. I had studied the question and studied the case almost, almost abstractly. And when I stood in the, in the cell, I thought, this really happened. <laughs> All right, hold on a second. You know, it was 14 months spent here. You know, so it became real uh, in a particularly challenging way. And I always loved the utopia because I actually do love satire myself. Uh, and I enjoyed the wit of Thomas More uh, immensely. Um, but it, it was that kind of fundamental wonder. You know, how did a man play a part like this unto death? And that was the, the sort of beginning of, of the serious. Uh, study of it. You know, and I had a wonderful, wonderful, I should add, wonderful, great teacher. And I owe to him um, a profound debt of friendship uh, for, um, for many, many things. So, combination, the cell, the teacher, study, time, admiration. <laughs> a recipe like that. So, in any case, thank you all. And I hope you sit down. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. That was tremendous. Uh, it was really something to behold these 65 or so uh, congressional staffers when Professor Smith started talking about the difference between flattery and friendship. 
uh, it, it uh, uh, evoked particular interest. And it was a, a great pleasure uh, uh, to, uh, to hear this talk and, and to know that uh, uh, in addition to this, there would be so many other topics on which uh, Professor Smith uh, could, uh, uh, could speak. In fact, uh, I think what we'd like to do is tomorrow have an all-day seminar on Dante. <laughs> No, we do look forward to, uh, uh, to your returning even, and, and uh, uh, from all of us who have learned much from you, thank you very much for, uh, for, uh, for your words of wisdom this evening. I want to make just one quick announcement, and then there are food and refreshments uh, awaiting uh, us all. The next talk that we'll have here is part of our Kirby Center lecture series. It will be held on July the uh, 12th, uh, 12.30 p.m. We're going to hear from uh, Stephen Hayward of uh, the American Enterprise Institute, and he's going to connect up some things between uh, his study of the environment, in particular the Environmental Protection Agency, some interesting court cases, and ask the question about the EPA whether there is anything connected to the protection of private property in what it does. Uh, for those of you who are uh, not participants in uh, the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program, I know there are many of uh, you students here, we're looking forward to a, a great summer of uh, various excursions, including Gettysburg on uh, the, the 16th of this month. We'll have some other speakers and other things that will come up. I know uh, many of you uh, have had a chance to study with Professor Tom Connor. He's going to be speaking in a continuing part of this uh, Fusco lecture series. So more on that later this summer. Thank you very much uh, all for coming.